Premier's idea too. We did. All very nice. Reminds me. Put the tree up. Coming up, over £19 billion of benefits is going unclaimed in the UK. We show you how to check if you're owed money. Also, back pain affects 80% of Brits. Find out how changing the position of your pillows when you sleep could ease the aches. And award-winning singer and West End star Beverly Knight's here to tell us about starring in the BBC's Big Night of Musicals. Welcome to Morning Life. Do you know the first thing everybody has said when they came into the building this morning? Oh, isn't it cold? Oh, it's chilly. Yeah, I told you. First thing, it wasn't like it was in my car. It was minus two degrees. Like I think it's burning through now, but we've been covered by mist and fog this morning in Manchester. It's definitely big coat weather. Snow and ice warnings are in place across the UK. BBC Cost of Living correspondent Coletta Smith's here. Talking energy. Energy suppliers will be offering homes discount to use less electricity at peak times this evening, Coletta. Yeah, today's the first day that the scheme kicks off for this year so this is a scheme by national grid your energy supplier has to be signed up for it and then you have to be signed up with your energy supplier in order to qualify for this suppliers provide that incentive in different ways some give credit to your account some give money back some give money off some give prizes it depends who your supplier is but it's between 5 and 6 30 tonight national grid say we've got enough energy don't panic people we're not going to have blackouts but they're trying to manage that energy supply better because of course tonight more people turn the lights on turning the oven on turning the heating on because it's so cold out there. It is, yeah. The future, isn't Turn it? Turn your heating on a bit later, yeah. It's, uh, as we get into the colder months. Uh, all over the news this morning, BBC Breakfast, Five Live as well, talking about uh, the rise in uh, rents. Mm -hmm. um, loads of benefits have been unclaimed, so we'll get into the bottom of that with you in just a few minutes too. And sticking with energy bills, they're set to increase from January. So we're going to be looking at how we use appliances and devices around the house because it's more important than ever. We've got a top tech, tech expert explaining why vacuuming your fridge can help make it more efficient. That's in 20 minutes. Uh, plus around 2 million Brits live with winter depression, also known as seasonal affective disorder. And SAD lamps have become a popular way to help treat it. But with so many on the market claiming to help sufferers combat their symptoms, in around 10 minutes, we investigate whether they actually work. And just before 9.45, cook Yvonne Cobb serving up some great hacks in the kitchen. She's going to show us how to renew a non-stick pan using table salt. Big chat in the office this morning. And make rusty trays look as good as new with a potato. <laughs> Simple potato. Uh, Dr Tom Naylor is here uh, today talking about back pain. 80% of the UK have a complaint about uh, back pain. It can really affect sleep, can't it? Yeah, absolutely. And with the cold, damp weather we've been having, I've got some tips that can help you get you through because people are really suffering, and including a few stretches. Mm. Uh, yeah, look, well, the stretches, actually, we're going to try and integrate into Strictly Fitness today. Really. Yeah, it's the biggest crossover since Hobby City and Casualty. We'll bring them back <laughs> stretches <laughs> to Strictly Fitness. Uh, that's what Tom has suggested. And we're doing this all with musicals week as we look at molly and carlos's a lot about strictly being exercise but actually mobility movement just as important of course that'll be good at the end of the show but first uh, a new report released this morning shows more than one in five private renters over the age of 55 in england are struggling to afford basic living costs and of course Coletta, this is a massive worry for so many people at the moment. Yeah, it is. You know, when you think about a private renter, so someone renting off a private landlord, most people think of a younger person, maybe someone living in a flat. But actually, new analysis today from the National Housing Federation gives a really different picture because they've seen a 70% increase over the last decade of people aged over 55 who are renting privately. Now, that's mostly because there's been much less affordable social housing built over that same period. And when you look at how much those in individuals are earning, how much they're receiving. Their data shows that almost half of pensioners who rent from private landlords are in the lowest income bracket in England, so earning around £11,000 a year or receiving £11,000 a year or even less. That makes them much more likely to be entirely dependent on their pension to pay the whole of their rent, which is a real struggle for people at the moment. There is help, though, isn't there, for people on low, low income? There is, and actually there's been some big changes around housing benefit just within the last week, so I'll talk you through some 
of those. This is for low-income pensioners who are going to be able to claim from their local council housing benefit to help pay their rent. The thing is, lots of people don't claim it who are entitled to it. In fact, more than a quarter of a million pensioners who are entitled to it don't claim it at the moment. So it's really worth checking if you're eligible at the moment for that housing benefit. But what's happened since 2020 is that amount of housing benefits, which changes depending on where you live in the country, has been frozen. So frozen to, since 2020 at the same time that rents have been mm. skyrocketing. So for a lot of people, it's been really difficult to make those two ends meet because their housing benefit doesn't even come close to covering their rents over the last couple of years. The good news is that you can get some extra discretionary housing benefits from some local areas. Apply to your local council for that. Some of the pots have run out of money, but it's definitely worth an ask. And the Chancellor just announced last week in the autumn statement some big changes around this. The good news from April is that housing benefit is going to go up. So at the moment, the statistics show that only uh, around 3% of private rented properties are available effectively for people who are on housing benefits. The Chancellor wants to increase that. So he's going to say, within your local area, housing benefits should cover the, the bottom 30% of properties. So much more money in people's pockets, more properties will be available to people, but that's only from April. Yeah, so that's in a few months' time. So much billions, billions of pounds worth of money gone unclaimed. Uh, and one of the hardest hits are pensioners, mm, aren't they? Mm. Well, the other thing that people should really look out for, particularly if you are a pensioner, is the idea of pension credit. So that's an extra top up as well. Uh, and as you say, it's billions a year. It's 1.7 billion unclaimed by pensioners each year. This is the, the, the least claimed benefit, as it were, the, the, the benefit that people tend to miss out on most. It's an extra £200 if you're a, a single. It's an extra £300 if you're claiming it jointly with your partner. Um, but yeah, there are around 850,000 eligible households who aren't claiming at the moment. So check whether you can claim. If you're on a low income and you're a pensioner, the likelihood is that you could claim pension credit, which would help. That's pensioners' benefits. At the other end of the spectrum, childcare benefits have also been in the headlines, haven't they? You know, why are so many UK families missing out on £2,000 worth of childcare benefits? It's crazy. The statistics show that only around 36% of eligible families claimed it in the last year. So that's so, so many people missing out on what could be £2,000 worth of extra help, free money from the government, if you fulfil the criteria. Um, so it's w for working households uh, and there's various other criteria that you need to apply. And this is for tax-free childcare. So it's you putting in, say, £8, the government will top up an extra £2 and that £10 can then go to your childcare provider. So it doesn't depend on income necessarily. There's a high income threshold, so if you're earning more than a certain amount, then you won't get it. But for the vast majority of households, you will be able to claim this. Big reason why people don't is it's not straightforward. It's easy to either be put off in the first place, to not have heard of it, to not realise that you can apply for it. And then you have to keep reapplying. I've fallen foul of this one quite a few times, as, as of a couple of pals of mine. You have and to keep reapplying. You're struggling. Exactly. It's yeah. my job to understand all of this stuff. And you have to keep reapplying every three months. So it's, it's, it's a tricky one. And a lot of people, as well as the not understanding it, a lot of people won't actually know that exists. Mm. Yeah, well, actually, that's, that's something David's been in touch about. I think uh, a lot of people feel the same. He's saying, can I, can I just go somewhere and, and put in my details that tells me what I'm eligible for? So it, it, in terms of a physical place and speaking to a person, head to citizens advice, they'll point you in the right direction. They will help do a benefits calculator for you. But there's also stuff online. So if you've got access to the internet, then go to Turn to Us, go to Policy and Practice or another website called Entitled To. You can put in your information, a couple of details, and it'll tell you what benefits you're entitled to, if there's any that you're missing out on. So we all know prices are rising at the moment. As you say, rent's increasing, mm -hmm. everything else is too. A bit of extra cash can really help yeah. people get through at the moment. And if it's there for you and available, go exactly. find it. Exactly. Some good organisations, though, to, to rely on, they're all, of course, on our website, so do check them out, bbc.co.uk forward slash morning live. Yeah. After you. Thanks. Money worries and the darker winter days can really add pressure to people's mental health. And on Morning Live recently, we talked about seasonal affective disorder. That's a type of winter depression that over 2 million people in the UK live with. Uh, there are various ways to manage the symptoms, including special SAD lamps to mimic the sun. Presenter Katie Thistleton went to find out whether they actually work. 
As the nights draw in and the weather turns colder, you may be finding it's having an impact on your mood. Unlike a lot of people, I actually love the winter months and I tend to feel at my best this time of year. I actually get quite stressed during the summer months and I find as the days start getting shorter, my mood improves and I just love being at home on a cold, dark, cosy winter's evening. However, I appreciate I'm probably in the minority. I've come to speak to some shoppers in Telford to find out if their mood is being impacted by these darker months. So how do you feel in the winter months when the nights are dark and cold like this? It puts me in a low mood. I just want to hibernate, stay in warmth. <laughs> when it starts getting dark really early, I feel like I want to go to bed. While some people may feel a bit blue during the winter, others suffer from something more severe called Seasonal Affective Disorder, or SAD. It's a form of depression that's thought to affect around 2 million people in the UK. Ali from Stoke-on-Trent is one of them. She developed SAD six years ago. How did you know that it was depression related to the seasons and not year-round depression? Because I don't go to any other time of the year. It just suddenly comes on. Uh, the end of August, beginning of September, it just it just hits me like a bolt out of the blue. What does it feel like? It's it's just you don't want to see people, you don't want to go out, which is the worst thing. You need to go out and get some daylight. It started going a bit gloomy at two o'clock, and I'm looking at the clock, thinking it's only two o'clock, you know. Ali says her GP advised increasing the dosage of her vitamin D supplements and getting more sunlight during the winter. I mean, not everybody can afford to go away, but that is what I do. I save my money and I go away because that's the only way I can cope. Dr John Van Niekerk is from the Royal College of Psychiatrists and treats patients with SAD. Can you tell me what SAD actually is and how does it differ from just sort of having the winter blues? Seasonal affective disorder is a much more severe disorder. This is where people are having persistent low mood. We see people oversleeping, um, overeating, and a sort of fatigability that affects them in their day-to-day -day functioning. So if someone's watching this and they think they might be suffering with seasonal affective disorder, what would you recommend? My strong advice is go and see your GP so that a proper diagnosis can be made and proper treatment. Um, the National Institute for Health and Care Excellence, or NICE guidance, recommends that seasonal affective disorder should be treated like any other type of depression. So this includes talking therapy, like cognitive behavioural therapy, and medication if required. Another tool often used to treat the condition is SAD lamps. They're available for anyone to buy and you don't need a prescription. They're designed to be placed next to the user for a set amount of time each day, delivering a dose of light that could have similar benefits to being in sunlight. Certainly, I've looked after patients where they found them very helpful. Make sure it provides an exposure of at least 10,000 lux of light and pro produces as little or no UV light as possible to protect your eyes. Um, and the typical recommendations include using the light box within the first hour of waking up in the morning for about 20 to 30 minutes. You know, some people would argue even in winter months, just going outside, there's a big old sun there that's, for, that's free. You don't need, to, you don't need to, to pay for it. And sitting by the window, uh, you know, you'll get natural light as well. Throughout the colder months, not only are the days shorter, but we tend to spend more time indoors. Getting outside more can still increase your exposure to sunlight, even on a cloudy day. But for those opting for an SAD lamp, where do you start? I'm just scrolling through now and there are so many different types and very different price points as well. There's one here that's just $9.99, there's another that's £70 here and one here that's nearly £300. So what do you go for? To help me understand what to look for when buying an SAD lamp, I've come to meet Aicha Donaghy, CEO of the Lighting Industry Association. Aicha's colleagues have been running some tests in their independent testing lab on three SAD lamps we found online, ranging from £15 to around £60. Interestingly, any lamp can be marketed as an SAD lamp, but they aren't all registered as medical devices. These three aren't, meaning it's unlikely they've been through any additional testing. Firstly, they were tested for their UV output. Aicha, I'm desperate to know, what did your testing reveal? All products were risk group zero or exempt, which means that it should not cause any hazard to the end user. That is good news. Next, the colour temperature. The products were all within 1% of their claims, so that means that they are close to that natural sunlight that they say they are. 
And finally, the lux levels. It's recommended that SAD lamps have a brightness level of 10,000 lux to mimic outdoor light. All three lamps pass this test, but Aisha's team also tested how far away you need to be from the lamp to get the 10,000 lux. It was the lowest price point product that performed best when it came to lux levels. It actually, you could sit as far away as 18 centimeters from that product to get the 10,000 lux. From the mid of the range, it was 13 centimeters, and for the highest price point product, it was 8 centimeters. Wow! So in this instance, price didn't necessarily indicate that the lamp was going to be better performing as a sad lamp? No, I think out of the three products tested, it's fair to say that it was the lowest price point product that performed best. So how do you know what to look for when it comes to buying an SAD lamp? Do your research, have a look at the instruction manual, see what distance it tells you to sit away from the lamp to achieve that desired effect. And then if you really want that extra reassurance, then you could look for that classification on the product of the class 2A medical device. That means that it's undergone third-party verification and testing. A combination of the vitamin D, the light box and the sun. But I can't say why, whether it's a light box, whether it's a combination of everything. The scientific evidence showing SAD lamps actually work to help treat the disorder remains limited at the moment, but lots of sufferers seem to find them helpful. If you are going to buy one of these lamps, just bear in mind, price isn't necessarily the best indicator of effectiveness. And we mustn't forget that we've all got access to that free sad lamp in the sky, the sun, even if it feels like we don't see it as much this time of year. Yeah, getting out and about is good. Uh, I tried uh, one of those SAD uh, lamps. cost me about a tenner mm -hmm. uh, in the morning, five o'clock. It works. helps me wake up a bit more naturally. I'm a bit less grumpy. Don't you, don't you find that? Are you? Wow. Um, <laughs> wow. A little bit less grumpy? <laughs> Maybe a little bit. You're delightful. Yeah, thanks. Um, sleep does affect your mood. Mm -hmm. Something that affects your sleep is back pain, which we've talked about today. 80% of people suffer with, particularly at this time of year. Yeah, so the cold weather, the cold, damp weather especially, is really affecting people. You tend to find that people that have existing aches and pains, the cold weather makes everything a bit more stiff, a bit less supple, and then that increases the feelings of tension and discomfort. And there's some theories, actually, that it's the atmospheric pressure and the humidity in the air that changes and irritates those sensitive nerve endings that just make people feel like they're just generally in more pain, yeah? Mm. The other thing we keep referring to is the cold weather. You're an orthopaedic surgeon. Yeah. Does the cold weather affect your bones? Yeah, so it's more just the sensation and the feelings that you get from it. But we covered there as well about the sleeping side of stuff. So when you have bad sleep, that makes your pains feel worse. When you have bad pain, it makes your sleeping worse. So people can be affected significantly by it. It's like a vicious cycle, isn't yeah. it? And no sleep is the beginning of all the evil. So you've got some examples of good sleeping positions yeah. and bad sleeping positions. Talk us through the, what we should be doing when we're lying down at night. Fine. So if you're someone that is affected by pain after you've been having a bad night's sleep, there's a couple of positions that you can adopt that may help things. And the way that these sort of help improve your symptoms is they change the alignment of your spine. So Good sleeping postures you see there at the top. You've got a pillow there wedged underneath and between your, between your legs. Now what that does is that levels out the pelvis and changes the alignment of the spine to something much more neutral. And then the bottom picture you can see, that's pillows underneath your legs while you're lying on your back. And again, that changes the tilt of the pelvis and the spinal alignment. And that, for some people, can help improve their symptoms. Just looking at that makes you think it feels like you're taking the pressure off yeah, exactly. your lower back. Uh, I just saw um, Pam here has just got in touch saying, could you please tell me the best pillow positions to help with arthritis, which I have in both shoulders and my collarbone. Sorry, so we've seen some, yeah, that's really, really mm. painful, isn't it? So yeah. some good examples there. What should you not be doing then? So in terms of, you, you need to find a combination that works for you. If it's affecting your arms and your upper limbs, sometimes wedging a pillow under your armpit can help take the pressure off your shoulders. And that's what we do when we position patients for theatre and they're lying on that side as well. Bad positions. Now, these are things that may, you know, make things worse. And it's if you're lying on your side with too many pillows propped up under your head, or you've got that twisted spine position, and the bottom one there, that represents lying on your front. Now, that's more of an extended position, and some people do find that that triggers their pain a lot more often. And so how do you stop moving at night, then? You want to be yeah. sort of staying in one position. You can't help it if you're turning, turning over. This is a big thing, isn't it, really? We all move in our sleep at night time. So the trick I've got, tennis balls. A couple of balls in bed with you at night. Pop them in your pyjama pockets, and that will help prevent you from rolling onto your sides because you've got that uncomfortable spiky thing that's there, so you won't be sort of, like, naturally moving over.
Good you can just wedge a child in either side. It <laughs> has the same effect. Um, <laughs> Pam, there, message about her pain. How can people manage the pain at home? Because it is difficult for people to get a GP appointment at the minute. Yeah, services are quite overwhelmed. But the good news is, is that for the majority of back pain, you don't need to see a GP for it, and there's lots you can do at home to help manage things. The key thing is exercise and stretches. OK, so there's things that you can do when you sat down, even stretches that are helpful and beneficial. And I think we're going to get Reese to demonstrate some of these as well for us. So if you reach over your head as high as you possibly can, yeah. that's going to extend out. And then Reese, if you reach down round to your ankles, curving that, that spine over, that's flexion. Mm. And then one that feels really good is rotation. So an arm behind the couch, really push into that twist as well. And everyone breathes a nice sigh of relief as this feels <sighs> really, really good. I love how we're making the young man demonstrate the stretches. It never so well. Mm. That's good. Um, so there's a couple of other top tips yep, as well. Exactly. So what we've got here is something that pretty much everyone's got in their house at the moment. So a hot water bottle. What you can do, fill this up nice and warm, and then you can either pack this behind your back, especially with a waist strap like this, for you when you're at home, or when you're out and about in the cold as well. Something to mention with these, there have been some headlines about injuries and problems with hot water bottles, so make sure you're not using boiling water in them and that you've got plenty of cover in it so it's nice and sort of comfortable and protected from your skin. Some tips, a, a, a mobility, yeah. getting out for a short walk maybe also... Absolutely. Staying too. mobile, staying active, lots of short walks, that's helpful, and that will help keep those core muscles that support your spine active. Now, okay. if you do go far the other way and you've done a bit too much during the day, you've been out in the garden, say, or your job is very active, then the opposite of the hot water bottle, an ice pack might help. Okay. Now, what the ice pack does is that helps to reduce inflammation and swelling in the regions that have just been overworked, but it's important to use that for a short period and then move on to your hot water bottles. Ice pack on your back in this weather, that'd be yeah. a challenge, but worth it, and then you can add it to the hot after. Uh, Rob's been in touch, says he's been having back problems since the summer. And this is the question, isn't it? At what point do you think, actually, this is quite serious yeah. and you need medical attention? Yeah, so all those things we mentioned are great. Exercises available from links we'll put on the website as well that you can go. But if all of that has failed and it's not helping, then you may need to get some more important contact. And the additional things, if you've got night sweats, weight loss, if you've got an associated history of cancer, or you have symptoms of numbness tingling down both legs, those are things we want to know about much more urgently. And oftentimes, NHS 111 is a good way of getting in touch to know what's available for you at the most perfect times. Mm. Thank you. Indeed. It's really annoying, it's isn't same. it? It's good to get yeah, some tips. Mad. Yeah, I'm moaning about it all the time. Mm. Uh, that's why I'm grumpy. Uh, still to come, singing sensation Beverly Knight will be talented about starring in the BBC's Big Night of Musicals. She's in the green room. She's a superstar, so we thought, you know, we show her the green room first before she We all feel like we've got a real sort of icon Great. in the building, don't we? We're like, oh, this Beverly. is a present. <laughs> Me! Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we'll be chatting to Bev uh, about taking uh, to the stage with Gavin and Stacey actor Ruth Jones, amongst other things. Uh, We've got a musical number to learn with Reese in Strictly Fitness at the end of the show. You've been demonstrating Dr. Tom's stretches. You've got to incorporate them. Yes, that's right. We're going to put Dr. Tom's stretches into our Strictly Fitness routine. As well as it being musicals week, we're going to have... What a great dance. That effect, doesn't it? Yeah, I know, just bouncing up and down. And whilst uh, Reese might be warming up in the studio, the cost of heating our homes hasn't been so easy to manage with energy bills set to increase from January. How we use gadgets and appliances around the house is more important than ever. Technology journalist Georgie Barrett is here to explain some of the ways we're wasting money on so-called vampire devices. I love this term. I know, it's a good term, isn't it? It sounds like we should be speaking about it during Halloween. Yeah, so a vampire device is basically an appliance that draws electricity without maybe you realising. So it's the things that are on standby. Um, and the most recent figures from British Gas say that we're spending about £147 per year on all these devices being on standby. And lots of people don't know that's the case. Break it down then. Who or what are the worst offenders. OK, I've got a list for you. You're going <laughs> to like this. Um, so at the top of our list, we have the TV. Mm -hmm. The TV being in standby, so it's just using your remote instead of actually going off over to the TV and turning it off at the mains. That sets you back £24.61 pence per year. Um, and whilst you're over there, if you have a set-top box, you know, a box that gives you access to other channels, um, that sets you back £23.10. Um, your microwave, because it's always got that dial that's lit up, if you're not using it, turn it off, you could save yourself 16 
£15.37. Um, and a games console as well, because it's linked up to the internet, it can be uploading, doing various things when you're not using it, um, and that can set you back at £12.17. And I know they're not huge figures, but then when you add them all together, yeah. it does get to around £150, which and, is a lot. And for me, you look at those numbers, and while everybody's watching money, you think, oh, that's a coffee out with a friend, or that, you know, they're things that you could put back into your life. You talked about TVs, games consoles, top boxes. If they're all on one plug, you're going to turn your Wi-Fi off and stuff, aren't you? Yeah, so there are some tips I can talk you through to make it a little bit easier so you're not running around the house like a maniac turning off all the switches. <laughs> um, so you can very um, very um, easily get one of these, which is just an extension cable that allows you to like yeah link up maybe your TV and your set-top box and games console. So that's just one switch will turn them all off. Um, I'm a big fan of these. The this is a smart plug. Um, you can get them for under £10. You put it into your appliance and that, that links it up to an app, which means you can control it via your phone. You can set schedule for it you can turn it off when you're out the house things like that so they're really good um, and you can also get plugs that you use a remote control to turn off so maybe if there's a plug that's quite far away just use your remote control but that's such a good idea isolating those power sources on that extension cable individual switches yes oh, absolutely John, absolutely yeah. uh, Joanne says I switched my cooker my microwave off immediately after using them dawn my TV computer microwave and printer yeah, all go off well at done. the wall we're not in use power is just too expensive to waste that's the point isn't it but what about when it comes to appliances that we can't turn off. I don't like the fridge yes. or freezer. How do yeah, you make that Yeah, don't turn your work? fridge or freezer off. No, That's exactly. really dangerous yeah, for your yeah. food. Um, yeah, so, you know, fridge freezers are pretty power hungry. They use up about £143 of electricity per year. So I do have some tips on making a fridge freeze freezer the most efficient it can be. Um, so first of all, you want to dust off the coils. So the coils you'll find at the back of your fridge freezer, they can get really dusty. I've um, never done that. I know. It's quite a job, but um, it can make your um, fridge freezer perform 20 25% more efficiently. Um, and then when you're putting your free fridge freezer back um, up against the wall, make sure you leave a little bit of room for ventilation because you don't want it to overheat. So we recommend about five centimetres of ventilation. Um, make sure the seals of your mm. doors working correctly. You can usually tell if it's not quite sticking um, as best as it can. And you can buy those online for about £30. Um, and then both with your fridge and with your freezer, you basically want to keep it about two thirds full. Um, so not too full because otherwise it has to work really hard to cool everything down but also not too empty so if you're maybe getting towards the end of your food shop you can fill up some jugs of water and put them in your fridge and then that just takes up a bit more space because basically the air uses energy to cool it down and you can also do that in your freezer by using bottles of water as well um, and then you probably know these ones but um, you don't put hot food in your mm. fridge because it has to work really hard to cool it down um, and make sure you defrost your freezer regularly that's also quite a big job isn't it you've got to get everything out so right. satisfying though i know and then chiseling freezer it off tea. Good i like job it to do, isn't it <laughs> yeah um loads of people getting their decorations up yes don't scowl at me i know it's early but you're allowed <laughs> um, can we justify keeping the Christmas tree lights on for the next month? I feel like we can. They actually don't use up that much electricity. So if, you, if you're going to have your Christmas tree lit up for the whole of December, it costs you about £1.30. So I feel like we don't need to go around turning that off. Or you could use one of these if you wanted to be really smart. I was going to say, so what, that's for an average household £1.34? Yes, if you've, got, if you've got a massive light display on the outside of your house, that's probably going to... George, don't great, pick it. Don't let me. But the plug's me. great because then you can, you know, you want them to be on when you come home. You I can know, set it for them. exactly. And no one's going to be looking at them at 3am, are they? It all adds up. Thank you very much. Thank really you, useful George. stuff, that. Thank yeah. you, Georgie. Listen, we're going to try and save you some more money in the kitchen now with cook Yvonne Cobb. It's never been more important to keep the things we own in good condition and lasting as long as possible. And if you've got plans to entertain family and friends over the festive season, Yvonne's come to the rescue with her hacks to help keep your utensils as good as new. In the war on stubborn stains, sticky pans and burnt-on dinners, it can often feel like you're losing an endless battle to keep your pans clean. Kitchen pans and utensils really aren't cheap, so if you're anything like me, you like to hold on to them for as long as possible. I've got some simple tips to share with you. First up, non-stick pans can be a nightmare to keep non-stick. You can buy a non-stick repair spray, which is about £8, but I have a hack. We can use table salt for this. We'll have absorbed the oil and food that was stuck to your pan. It's probably not a good idea to use on your chips. 
but you can save it and reuse for my next hack, how to clean wooden spoons. If there's any sort of staining from turmeric, for example, this helps get rid of this. Use some salt and then a half of a lemon and then scrub. Sometimes this works, sometimes it doesn't, but if you feel like it needs a little bit more work, you can use sandpaper. And this will take the extra layer of those stubborn stains off. So to reseal the spoon, you would wash it and then coat it with a neutral oil such as grape seed oil. It then goes in the oven at 260 for a few minutes and voila, good as new. So if the wooden spoon smells, you can make a paste with bicarb of soda and lemon and then rub it in. And a good scrub. You can also use white vinegar and that works too, but the reason it works is the citric acid from the lemon really penetrates in to get rid of the smell. It also works well with chopping boards or anything wooden that you have in your kitchen. And finally, it's time to bring rusty bacon trays back to life. Another hack is to deal with the rust that you see. What you can use is a potato. Potatoes have got oxalic acid inside, which is a natural ingredient that's found in a lot of cleaning products. So half a potato and it'll work smashing. It'll dissolve all of the rust away. Pour washing up liquid on first and then press down with your potato and give it a good wipe over the surface. Wow. It's brilliant. Can anyone see any rust? So, hopefully with these tips, it means your kitchenware will last a lifetime, or at least a few more winters. Wow, she was in her element. Yes, I also like the way that you can use a potato that you might have otherwise yeah, chucked out when it's, so you know. Clever. Just trying to save a bit of cash. Very That's good. the thing, isn't it? Um, we were talking earlier, Georgie, to you about how we can make appliances in our homes use mm. more, uh, use less energy. Diane says, if I'm buying tech or appliance gifts over Christmas, how do I know if I'm buying something that's energy efficient? Very good question. So if you're buying an appliance, then often it will come with an energy efficiency rating score. It goes from A to G, A being the best energy rating score. And sometimes it can be a little bit more expensive if you're getting an A one, but if you work out how long it will cost you in the long term, if you're working out the um, amount of energy it's going to use, then I would recommend going with an A school one. Mm. Good place to start in your research. Also talking about back pain uh, today, Tom. Uh, as you can imagine, lots of people have been in touch who, who struggle with it. Billy says, I've heard TENS machines are good for back problems. Is this true? What is it? What's a TENS machine? So a TENS machine is transcutaneous electrical nerve stimulation. I Ooh. thought that's what you were And say. the way in which it works <laughs> is it passes an electrical current through the skin and then that alters the way in which pain signals are sent back and received by the brain. Does it work? Maybe is the honest answer. So some people find it really useful, some people don't. And that's why NICE that issues recommendations on these kind of treatments hasn't got it in their recommendations, but it may work for certain people. I used it during labour. Yes, that's when most people well, have fond memories. <laughs> when you said what's a TENS machine, Colette and I both went... Oh, we know. I tense, up, I tense up at the thought of a TENS machine. Oh, really? Let's leave them in the past. Okay. Listen, I've got one. You can use it. You can have a try. Um, Colette has... It's not weird. It's a thing, isn't well, your it? your one. <laughs> Let's move on. Colette has been talking about unclaimed benefits. Lorna, I've been claiming carer's allowance since 2006. Does this contribute towards my pension? Yes, it should do, Lorna. Uh, it should add up towards those national insurance contributions. If you've been claiming for those years, it should top up for later on in life. Lovely. Thank you very much. Now, if singing, dancing and superstars are on your list for a Dream TV programme, look no further. The BBC's Big Night of Musicals by the National Lottery always puts on an impressive show. What a night it is. The celebration of musical theatre hosted by Jason Manford is packed full of performances by stars like Beverly Knight.
night. Good morning. Morning. What a treat to have you on Morning Live. What Thank a voice. You. That was in Manchester last year. It was. It was. Loved it. It's it's the voice that gets us every time. It's an amazing show, isn't it? The, the, the big night. Yes. Um, what can we expect this year, then? It is just packed full of great performances from musicals, um, some of which are going into the West End, some of which are around right now. You're going to see... Guys and Dolls are going to be there, which should be a lot of fun. Everybody's talking about Jamie um, and loads of other um, shows as well. I, I'm really excited about it, it. And the thing is about the shows is usually you're doing that in front of a theatre yes. audience. But from a performer point of view, uh -huh. it's very different being in an arena, I'd imagine. Yeah, it's a totally different scales that you're working to. Um, with an arena stage, you know, way deeper, way wider. So, and of course, the the, the, the little thing of, of all the audience who are there <laughs> watching and screaming. And um, so just kind of scaling up to fit into an arena is always a thrill. And for me, as someone who's had the honour of being in an arena and performing a few times, watching everybody else kind of go, this is amazing! Yeah. Is just fantastic. And the audiences love it. Love it. But just watching that clip, I mean, uh, you know, I couldn't sing for Toffee. If, <laughs> if I, I can, could. I can vouch for that. Uh, yeah, I mean, oh, God. But the idea of having a band, if that's your thing, that must be the dream, isn't it? You know, when you're a little girl in the shower singing into mm. the hairbrush and all of that, <laughs> that's the moment that you're dreaming of, isn't it? That big band, that huge audience. It must Absolutely. be so satisfying. Really satisfying. So to, to come into that kind of a space and you see all the, 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 the performers and they're, they're, they're getting ready and they're limbering up and then they stand on the stage and look out. Um, you know, you can see it in sound check and just the expression of, oh, my God. <laughs> yeah. It's so wonderful to see. It really, really is. And then audiences, the, the, the way they respond to these shows is it, it's glorious, really is. And I feel like since COVID, people, anecdotally especially, people have a new appreciation for live performances because we couldn't go to them. Yeah. It's almost like people have kind of gone, oh, we didn't realise what we had till we didn't have it. Absolutely right. So there is that, that extra layer of, I would say, a hunger yeah. for people to see performances right in front of their mm. faces as opposed to, you mm. know, through a screen. Yeah. And, and I think there's nothing more energising and exciting than having a live performance right in front of you. So yeah. a Wonderful. great night to look forward to. Yes. Of course, the big night of musicals, it's all about, you know, raising money for a great cause as well and yeah. proceeds go back to local theatre. That's right, yeah. So um, the the National Lottery, so the good folk at home who are playing the National Lottery, thank you, thank you, thank you. This is like a, a massive thank you to them um, for, you know, the fact that they play, you know, two pounds or whatever for, for a ticket. And that actually helps to feed back into grassroots mm. theatre and, and the great work that they do, not just within theatre itself, but on a wider scale, um, especially with young people, um, encouraging them to, to develop not just theatre skills, but life skills. And of course, all the tickets are free. We all like free. Do you want and, to sing uh, that? That's a, a high note. <laughs> free! <laughs> <laughs> um, and there's 12,000 of those free tickets to go around. So, yeah, it's going to be great. <laughs> the reason we were so excited when you were coming in here is because your career, you've, you've done everything, and that's testament to you and your skills, and it all started with your dad, didn't it? <laughs> yeah, my, both my mum and dad are musical, but my late dad... Oh, oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> Me and my dad. I was about... 13, 14 in that picture. Um, my dad used to have his own building company and he'd sing on the job. So everybody in Wolverhampton would be like, oh, there's Eddie, oh. he's on the roof singing again. <laughs> and uh, he just had such a powerful voice. And uh, I guess I got the power from dad and kind of the sweetness from, from mum. So I was very lucky. You've also very worked lucky. with all kinds of different people in, in your career. Next step, Ruth Jones. From Gavin and Stacey. Is that right? <laughs> yes, You're going to be on stage together? We will be on stage. We're both going to be dressed as nuns. We're going to be in the habit um, in Sister Act next year. So a nice little musical theatre theme That's there. That's going to be brilliant. And then she can get you on Gavin and Stacey if they decide to bring... Do you know anything about this? Are they bringing another one back? If they did, I'd be like, can I have a little, little yeah. role for me? <laughs>
also, no. congratulations, milestone birthday, and of Thank course, you. you won an award. I did, I won an Olivier Award, which was unbelievable, so thrilled to death with that, absolutely chuffed. We well, totally yeah. deserve congratulations. Thank you so much. Lovely to have you on the show, the big Thank night you. of musicals by uh, National Lottery from earlier this year, still available on, to watch on iPlayer. Uh, now then, it's time for Shirtly Fitness. Bev's going to like this. You might recognise the <laughs> tune. Uh, Reese Stevenson is standing by. Uh, cue the music. Oh. Let's go. Musical week continues. We're in Act Three, but we're also doing some back stretches as well for good measure. Let's uh, start off. Reece, just so we're going to take it. We're going to do Tom's moves. Yes, earlier. I'm we just are going to take our time and go through these properly because people are asking to see these stretches for yeah. their back pains. Absolutely. Right? So, so the, well, we'll this is going to be time. quite a, a, a strict back strictly fitness. So the first stretch is you're going to bring your knees up here and keep your back straight. And you're just going to hold that and feel that stretch there. And then you're going to lower your leg and then do the same with the other. There we go. Cool. Who's dropping things? It's me. I like to commit to Honestly, the move. Oh, so uh, the shoes are gone again. The next thing, <laughs> Dr. Tom showed us earlier, you hold your hands out like this, and we're just going to twist. Don't go too hard. Just feel it. No, there you, yeah, yeah. If you're saying ooh, ooh you're doing it right. That's good. That's good. And the final thing is the hand flicks. Now, I want you to extend your hands as high, as far as you can. So, bam. Bam. And then really just add some character. Flick your head if you want. If you've got a good head of hair, shake it. Love Shake it. it. Um, before Fair we enough. get into the actual dance, we're doing a bit of a different Strictly Fitness today we because we've been talking about back pain. These are stretch, uh, stretches that are hopefully going to ease back pain. How long should you do these stretches for, Tom? As long as it feels comfortable for you, really. The key thing is to be moving nicely through that range of movement. Feel it push, feel it. Just have a little bit of a pull and mm. then ease back into the next one. So it shouldn't feel painful, but a nice... Not too painful, just nice. Nice, just nice stretch. little stretch. Just enough there, for yeah. a groan. Exactly. There were a few groans yesterday. <laughs> yeah, there were quite a few. Bev, you're going to like this song. Uh, Take it away, Alan. Oh. Here we go. With a midweek worker. Flick as you like. 